Hello, everyone, and welcome to JQD Hanukkah Hotties. My name is Carmel Tanaka, and I'm the founder and executive director of JQD Vancouver, a Jewish queer and trans nonprofit dedicated to queering Jewish space and Jewifying queer space in Vancouver, BC, on the ancestral and unceded territories of the Musqueam, Squamish, and Tsleil-Waututh peoples. If you do not know the land on which you live, work, and play, check out Native dash land dot ca. For Hanukkah this year, we are being generously supported by Creating Accessible Neighborhoods, an organization that advocates for and educates about disabled people with intersecting identities. You can learn more about this fantastic organization doing amazing work at canbc.org. For each candle of the holiday, we have a Hanukkah hottie joining us to light their Hanukkah, or perhaps share another tradition and chit chat about the wonderful things they do in life for the duration of the candles burning. For our fifth candle of Hanukkah hotties, we are joined by the Empress Mizrahi, AKA Matthew Nuriel. They are a non-binary content creator of Iranian Jewish descent living in Los Angeles, California. In recent years, the Empress Mizrahi has been using their voice to passionately advocate and fight for the causes they believe in namely LGBTQ plus rights and equality within the Iranian and Jewish communities and combating anti-Semitism. They have taken on leadership roles with both queer and non-queer organizations such as JDC Entwine, JQ International, and most recently with Tel Aviv Institute. In 2021, they were the recipient of the Trailblazer Award at the JQ International Annual Impact Awards Tuning in from Los Angeles, California, let's welcome the Empress Mizrahi. Hello. Hi. Hi, welcome. Thank you, Hanukkah Sameach. Hanukkah Sameach to you too. It's such an honor to have you here. I'm such an avid fan of your Instagram account. I mean, it's just blowing off the hook. You have so many followers. It's like being in the presence of a celebrity. <laughs> Thank Somewhat you. I'll take it. <laughs> um, it's very exciting to have you here. And before we dig a little bit deeper into who you are and why we are bringing you here, why don't we open the space by lighting our Chanukiot? Okay. Does I have my, good? Yeah. I have my Jonathan Adler peacock menorah here. I like to call it my homo menorah. So I'm ready when <laughs> you are. I'll light my shamash. I'm going to join you too. For anyone else tuning in, you can also light yours as well with us. Candles are lit. And uh, before we tuned in, I asked uh, the Empress themselves uh, what prayer to use for the Hanukkah blessings. And I have been asked to do uh, the non binary Hebrew version. So I'm going to pull that on up. Give me a minute here. Here we go. And I'm going to put them onto the screen so you can all follow. It'll be the third one on each slide. So the first one here is the first blessing. Baruch Hatayin Chaim, Asher Kitchenu Bemitzvoteye, Vetsi Venu Lehadlikne, Shelchanuka. Amen. Second one Baruch Beautiful. There we go. Yes. 
beautiful to have you here. Thank you. Oh, I love opening this space with light, especially since the, the days are getting, well, they are technically getting lighter and lighter each day, but let me tell you, it's already dark here by 4 p.m. What getting lighter and lighter each day? Over here, it's getting darker and darker each day, but I like, 4.30 now the sun is setting. I hate it. It's so depressing. I can't do it. I, can't, I don't want to get out of bed in the morning. It's cold. It's like LA cold, I'm sure for you guys. I, I mean, awesome. your cold is our summer. <laughs> I mean, fit, listen, if it drops below 67 degrees, I'm done. I don't want to get out of my bed. <laughs> I wish I knew what that meant. I, I know that there's some sort of, you know, conversion from uh fahrenheit to celsius but you know i did i did have a stint in san francisco uh for a bit and i have to say some of the coldest i've ever been in my life san francisco's san francisco. horrible <laughs> san francisco's horrible go to go to san francisco i went to my birthday's in july i went to visit a friend my birthday last year because i was like i don't deal with birthdays i just want to get out of town and I drove to San Francisco. It was hot, 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 90 degrees. You get to the, like the Bay Bridge where you have to like pay the toll. All of a sudden there's like a dark cloud hovering over the city. I felt like I was entering in the, like in Mordor, like in the, in the <laughs> I was like, this is not where, what's happening? Why is it so cold? And I went running back home to LA, like within two days. I was just like, no, I'm sorry, I can't stay here. Mm -mm. can't stay well i'm glad that la has you you're doing fantastic work mm -hmm. uh we are such fans uh, especially in the jqd community Thank you. uh, you're an activist you're a speaker you're a voice who's really shining a light on very important issues not only on lgbtq rights but also on anti-semitism which is very rampant uh online uh how did you become the empress mizrahi where, where did this come from Tell us the origin story. Oh boy. Okay, I'll try to I'll try to tell it quickly because you know I'm long winded and everything in my life is long winded. So, I uh, moved here when I was 14. Uh, my parents divorced. Moved here from London, from the UK to Los Angeles, and within a year I came out. And within a few months of that, I just I discovered drag and I started doing it. But I stopped within a year of doing it because I come from an Iranian Jewish family, which is very sort of conservative and and it was the 90s and they just it just everybody everything imploded and then cut forward to like you know um fast forward another 20 years I'm doing stand-up comedy and acting and I'm getting into this uh whole field and I have some friends who are like let's do I, I remember saying how come there's no Persians on the house of the real housewives of Beverly Hills and my friends are like oh my right. god right how, like Beverly Hills like it's all Persians. Like, how do you mm -hmm, not have mm -hmm. a Persian on there? And my friends are like, oh, let's do a spoof on that. So we came up with the spoof, The Real Housewives of, of the Shahs of Sunset. And it was ridiculous. I didn't even shave. I put on a wig and like, <laughs> it was just this funny video that we did. And then that developed into something else, which developed into doing a live performance with this character that, that I created. And I was like, well, if I'm going to do this live performance, I'm never going to do this again. So let me do it right. So I hired a makeup artist. I got a nice outfit, a nice wig. And the response I got was just something I'd never experienced before in the few years that I've been doing stand up. And within two years of that, I kept doing it. And within two years of that, I had to admit to myself, like, you're not just a comedian playing a character. You're not just an actor, because that was my thing all the time. Like, oh, I'm just an actor. This is just a character I'm doing. I had to admit to myself, like, no, this has nothing to do with acting or comedy. This is about you wanting to be pretty. And that's kind of where it started. And it's continuously evolving. I mean, from that, it evolved into drag. And I wanted to be a drag performer, I, or so I thought. And more recently, it's evolved into this thing of like, well, now that I've realized that I'm non-binary and- Mazel tov. Thank you, thank you. That, that's a whole other like long story, but like realizing that made me realize like I don't necessarily, this isn't a performance for me. Like I had to ask myself like, why is it that I don't wanna go to clubs? I don't wanna go out with friends. I don't wanna like, be seen out partying unless this is all happening and mm -hmm. I realized it's not it's not drag because it's not a performance this isn't a character that I'm putting on this is me um it's just an elevated version of myself you know so 
I hope that answered your question. It sure did. And uh, why don't you tell us more about the Persian community that's um, in Los Angeles oh, and uh, how have they welcomed and embraced you as the Empress Mizrahi? You know, it's funny because I think there are probably members of my own family who are probably very embarrassed about it. And I myself have a lot of trouble. Like I would never be in drag in front of them um, because of my own issues with them. But with that said, I, I've, I've been working with and I'm affiliated with and involved with an organization here in LA called JQ International, which is Jewish Career International. And the work I was doing with them was for something called the Persian Pride Fellowship which was, so basically, yeah, it was incredible because the, the largest Persian community in the world outside of Iran, obviously, and the largest Persian Jewish community outside of Israel is in Los Angeles. So there's a lot of us here. Um, there's pros to that and cons to that. Um, it's a very insular community here. Um, so we realized there was a need that, that there's clearly like, a queer Persian Jew here, a queer Persian Jew there. Like, how do we unify us and, and empower us and embolden us? So we started the Persian Pride Fellowship and now we're like 30 plus um, um, people, 30 plus members of this community now where we basically built a community and through the work that we're doing, we've become a lot more visible um, to Iranian, to the Iranian and Iranian Jewish and I was Jew just gonna say not just the Iranian community. No, because the Persian Pride Fellowship is not just for Jewish Iranians, it's for any Iranians. Um, so um, we've become a lot more visible and we've done a lot of work like panels and so on and so forth with parents of queer Iranians and um, through that work we've started to make a lot of segue like there's a lot a lot more acceptance now than there was so there's still a long way to go it's still an insular and conservative community, um, but we're slowly getting to the place where being homophobic is not socially acceptable and they're slowly catching on to that. So that's a very big first step. That's wonderful. I'm really happy to hear that. Last year, we had the honor of having uh, one of your friends, Aria uh, Marvasi, who used to run JQ, or at least be part of JQ International. And so we had a little bit of a, we have a little bit of a primer, at least for people here at JQD, of what this uh, amazing celebration and community is. And I am so excited. One day, one day, I would love to be a fly on the wall and just attend <laughs> the events. That would be fantastic. Because I'm I want to be there for the food. I mean the Kubi day <laughs> and the Ta Dig. Oh she knows. Oh my God. <laughs> the girl knows for sure. <laughs> you have you have Persians. I don't know what city you're in in Canada. Oh, I'm in Vancouver, so further up north uh, from you, and there's a large Persian community here. Uh, but not Jewish. I don't think I've met a single Jewish Persian person here. Um, but yeah, like even my parents, they have a tenant who's uh, Persian and super lovely doctor, uh, unfortunately cannot practice uh, here in Canada because their doctor, whatever official credentials is not, you know, accepted oh. here in Canada. And even during the COVID crisis, which is super bizarre. But anyway, that's a whole other uh, side conversation. But yeah, very familiar with Persian food. And I think it's some of the best around. I mean, I'm not going to dispute that. <laughs> no, it's got flavor. It's got fat, yes. which I love. And the saffron and color. Listen, you know what you're doing. And that barbecue tomato. Yes, honey, mix sauce. this with the rice and eat it with your kebab. You're good. Yep. Yeah, that's all you need in life. <laughs> yeah, well, you also do uh, a few more things. And from my memory, you have this incredible Instagram channel. Thank you. How did you get started in that? Like, did someone say like, oh, you should really like put content on here. Like, how does one become a content creator? I mean, I've had Instagram for years, but it wasn't, I, I slowly started using it to kind of express my feelings instead of just posting cute pictures, um, probably two years ago, where I would post a picture and then I would talk about sort of, it was almost my way of getting more comfortable with my gender identity, um, because it's not something, I never came out as non-binary until, I don't know, six months ago. 
but I would start posting stuff about gender issues and my issues with with being an effeminate boy when I was a kid and um and then what happened was the Gaza Israel war in May of this year happened and I'm I'm a I'm a very outspoken person and I I can't stand to see injustices or I mean, what was happening was there was so much misinformation coming out and it was just spreading like wildfire. And people were so willing to accept this misinformation as fact, which really concerned me. Like, that's what concerned me the most. Like, why are you so willing to not do your research or not, you're, you're getting your information off of uh, an infographic from a supermodel, right? Like. No shade to supermodels. I consider myself one, but um, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. you know, don't don't. And I always post on my posts like, don't you know? I'll occasionally say like, don't take my word for anything. Look it up, Google it. We all have a wealth of information right at our fingertips. Like, there's no excuse. But anyway, that happened, and that's when I started to really say, okay, you really need to start like speaking up because the more all I'm a small voice, and all of the small voices maybe can make a dent and all of this horrific misinformation that's coming out. And, and that's when it kind of, people started paying attention to me. And um, that's when I realized, well, you know, you have a voice, you have something to say, so, and you have this platform, as small as it is, it's yours, say what you wanna say. Um, and I also realized that being very openly queer and gender non-binary, gender non-conforming and very, uh, Jewish and uh, Zionist, progressive Zionist, but a Zionist, I, I learned via all of the DMs that I started getting um, from other queer Jews that were like, I don't have a space where I'm comfortable being fully queer and fully uh, Zionist as well. And thank you. And so I just continued with that because I was like, okay, there's a need for this. There's, there, there's, there's a community of people scattered all over the world that don't feel, and these are feelings that I've had. So I was like, all right, we'll be open with it. And um, your people will find you and they're finding me. So that kind of- Well, you know, what you know. you're sharing right now is similar to, you know, what a lot of Jewish uh, community, especially queer community is dealing with. And in our early days uh, at JQD, so this is four years ago, we did a very, um, very small survey and we wanted to know what the needs of our community were. And what we found out is it's easier to be out as queer in the Jewish community than it is to be out as Jewish in queer community. Yeah. And that seems to be holding still true till today. And especially when there is conflict happening uh, halfway across the globe, it does affect what's happening here, regardless of where people stand on the conflict. Um, we're pigeonholed and categorized uh, into engaging in a conversation that not everyone wants to have because it's not always more often than not a safe conversation to have. So yeah. it's really important at JQD that we maintain a safe Jewish queer uh, space regardless of where people are at on that because we're, it's su such a divisive issue that if we start dividing ourselves then that's where you get people who are alone and disconnected and really siloed and disconnected from one another. Uh, right. We have a question from uh, the, our audience. How have you taken care of yourself when it feels like no matter what you do to try and educate the amount of misinformation just keeps getting worse? How have I taken care of myself? Um... I think what's really important, which I know not everybody has the luxury of having this, but it's really, whether it's online or in person, it's really important to surround yourself and to um, befriend people who hold the same beliefs as you. Otherwise you feel completely alienated. So that has helped me a lot. Um, other than that, I don't know. I'm fortunate enough to, as neurotic as I am, have a very strong sense of um, self-awareness and self-identity and, and a lot of resolve in who I am. And so it's hard to stay sane when you know, you're know you getting all of these DMs that are just straight up hate. Like, I, I hope that kind of answers the question. I think the number one point I'm trying to make is 
to find even if it's just one person or hopefully a community of people, um, get involved with JQD, to get involved with whatever Jewish queer organizations or Jewish organizations there are in your area where you can start surrounding yourselves with people that hold the same views as you so that you don't feel so alienated and alone. Mm -hmm. Having having friendship and support and that could be from chosen family from your own family if you're lucky to have that um is truly important because this can really eat at your soul okay. i find it to be very exhausting and you know you're dealing with it up down from all sides and sometimes you just need a break and uh I, i'm gonna do a little shout out to a little tiny group of people that i put together during uh, the last conflict in May uh, called Emo Jews. Um, we are, we're all friends and these were people who are like you were describing alone talking to me about it. And I'm like, that's great, but I can't to all of you. So I'm going to put you all into one thread <laughs> and y'all can talk about it when you got the spoons to talk about it. And we don't have the same opinion. We're very, we're quite uh, varied in the spectrum, you know, uh, which uh, is actually fascinating and has added to our understanding, I think a better understanding of what's going on because it's very nuanced. It's not uh, black and white by any means, it's far from that. And uh, some people, you know, are more heavily invested in it, having family there or are Israelis themselves. Um, and others are, you know, wanting to, to understand it better and may not have ever even been, so. It's a, a fascinating time. Um, I wanted to ask you, you know, because you're getting inundated, I'm sure, uh, in your DMs and you're dealing with, you're, you're literally addressing and focusing on anti-Semitism. I'm just curious, like what patterns or trends you've been seeing, you know, when you see other um, marginalized communities dealing with the racism and the hatred towards them, you know, how are you feeling when it's, when it's towards the Jewish community? Um, I'm sorry, how do I, are you're tying in, I'm confused. Yeah, I just want to know, like, because this is, I, I, I guess I did not ask that question clearly. So as someone who's mixed, you know, I come mm -hmm. from an Asian community background, but I'm also Jewish. And, you know, I see uh, and want to stand in solidarity with many other communities that are dealing with a uh, rise in hatred, particularly with the Asian community. I'm going to use that as an example. Um, but I don't often see it reciprocated. Uh, where the Asian community is standing with uh, the Jewish community. And I'm doing a complete generalization here. This is what I have experienced. This might not be the case for everyone else, uh, but me as an Asian in Vancouver, I'm not seeing uh, the reciprocal standing in solidarity with when, it, and we both are dealing with an insane rise in, in anti-Semitism and hatred towards our communities during COVID. Yeah, so I, I, that, that's a very hot sort of hot topic right now. Um, and for a while now is the, the, the fact that I feel like a lot of Jewish people who have put themselves sort of out there in solidarity with other minorities um, feel like it's not being reciprocated. And it's a very sort of hard thing. And I un completely understand like feeling like, what the fuck? Like I, I stood up for you, why aren't you standing up for me? I get that. For example, with Black Lives Matters, that's, that, that's like a big thing with a lot of Jewish people. Like we put our, we really stepped up to help or to be involved with or to march with Black Lives Matter. And we feel like a lot of members of, well, I mean, the, the organization itself is really shitting on Jewish people, let's be real. Um, but my whole thing with that is, is it, it shouldn't be transactional, first of all. If I'm standing up for or marching for or believe in Black Lives Matter, I'm not talking about the official organization, I'm talking about the actual movement and the actual ideal of Black Lives Mattering. I'm not doing it in order for, to, for it to be reciprocal. It would be nice and I would appreciate it. And I'm not, I'm not gonna sit here and say, it doesn't bother me that it's not reciprocal, but I have to really sit down and ask myself, if I really care about black lives, then why am I expecting something in return? So that's number one. Um, number two, uh, I don't know. It's a tough thing. I, we're really, Jew, Jew, the Jewish communities are really standing 
out kind of like on one leg by ourselves here. And I think that that's just the way it's always been for millennia. And I think it's probably always gonna be that way. I don't see how that's gonna change. And I'm sure other minorities feel the same way. Um, but it's really a lesson in um, independence and it's a lesson in not expecting anything from anybody. And that's sad, but it's the truth. And that's why I'm so glad we have our land back and we have Israel. And um, it, it really makes you question your own morality and your own ethics and your own ideals. And for me, it always comes down to, well, I'm not gonna stop standing up for other minorities just because they might not be standing up for me. And I also do want to name that a lot of stuff that's being publicized or a lot of stuff that people talk about is, oh, we stood up for, again, example, Black Lives Matter and they're not standing up for us. I do want to name that there are quite a number of non-Jewish uh, Black people and non-Jewish uh, other minorities who will message me and say, you know, I didn't know that. Thank you for sharing that. And that to me is so much more important to focus on and it's hard. So you really want, it's really easy to focus on the negative feedback you get, but that to me is so much more important to focus on because you've actually opened up somebody's eyes to something. Um, so I'm really appreciative of, of those people. And I also want to name that just because I find this super interesting and it's something I didn't know about that I'm learning about just through Instagram activists is that there are a lot of people, Hindu people who are finding solidarity with Jewish people um, which is super interesting, but yeah, again. On, on particularly what, I'm so fascinated now. I don't want to, I don't want to say anything wrong, but from my understanding, it is the, the, this is going to sound, so I never want to sound like I'm saying anything that I, I don't hate anybody. I don't have a problem with any group of people. I'm not Islamophobic. I don't have a problem with Muslims, but the truth of the matter is there was an Arab slash Muslim conquest of a very large region of the world. And um, that included India. And around the same time Israel was created, Pakistan was created as a solution, meaning like Muslims can live in Pakistan and the Hindus and everybody else can live in India. But apparently there's a, still an ongoing conflict within Pakistan mm -hmm. with the Hindus that live there and with uh, Muslims that live in, for example, Bangladesh or India. Um, so I think a lot of Hindu people are finding solidarity with Jewish people because Jewish people have uh, kind of have a similar conflict with the, the, I'm not talking about Muslim people, I'm talking about the generational learned behavior of the Islamic colonial imperialistic conquest. So that's why, and I hope that didn't offend anybody because it's the last thing I want to do. I think that's very interesting um, that you talk about that because I've used that as an example. That's why I asked the partition in particular when I'm addressing you, like there's, there's another example that's out there that we know of that's still going on today that we can learn from um, and, and really, you know, spread more awareness on. Yeah. Uh, I was curious what, which of your Instagram posts were the ones that encouraged people who were not necessarily Jewish to come to you and be like, oh, I really didn't know about that. Thank you for sharing. Uh, a lot of stuff that is about Mizrahi history. A lot of stuff about yes. Mizrahi history and also sometimes stuff about um, actually just as much stuff about Israel that was not known because the popular narrative right now that's being pushed is that Israel is a colonial settler state and it's all Europeans and people have this idea in their head and a lot of people don't want to let go of that idea because they like this sort of, I think people like this sort of good against evil sort of thing and the truth of the matter is it's not good against evil. There's no there's no angels, there's no devils. It's just human beings who are in a fucked up situation. Um, but yeah, when I post stuff about Mizrahi history, people are always like, oh, I didn't know that. I didn't know there was Jewish people, you know, from Iran or from any Middle Eastern or North African country. So uh, Mizrahi, that's why I'm, I love Mizrahi Heritage Month because it's really an opportunity to teach people. And when, when is that? It just ended, it's November. It's November. So listen, some of the people who are tuning in here may be Jewish, may not be Jewish, mm -hmm. uh, and 
probably are also learning for the first time uh, that there are Mizrahi Jews. Can you tell people what Mizrahi means and sure. how a little kind of like a, a little brief primer, a 101 in a minute or two? I'll try and keep it brief. <laughs> You'll let me know if I'm being long winded. Oh, you're doing great. Okay, good, because I'm very wordy. <laughs> Um, so basically Mizrahi in, in Hebrew means East. So Mizrahi refers to Jews of the East. Um, that's now come to encompass North Africa, which technically isn't East of Israel, it's West of Israel, but um, Mizrahim are basically Jews that never left the Middle Eastern region, the Levant, North Africa. Um, so it's basically Jews in Arab, Muslim majority or in my case, Iran, which is, is not an Arab country, it's a Persian country, but um, that's what that's who the Mizrahim are. Um, it does get a little bit muddled because in North Africa, particularly when the um, Inquisition happened in Spain, a lot of Jewish people went to, a lot of which would be Sephardi people went to North Africa just because of the proximity, it was so close. Um, and a lot of the liturgy is similar um, religiously and up until fairly recently, like this past century, everybody was just called Sephardi, but Sephardi means Spanish. And Middle Eastern Jews are not Spanish. We don't have any, we haven't had any time in Spain. Um, so it can be a bit controversial. There are people, you know, I have had people say, you know, Mizrahim is a racist term and it was created by the state of Israel to other, to other eyes, the, the uh, Jews coming from Middle Eastern countries. That may be the case, I don't know. That's, you know, it's pretty 50-50 with who you talk to. Yeah, there were things that happened within Israel that were really messed up in terms of how they treated the Mizrahim when we started to arrive uh, after it's the creation of Israel. But um, it's, for me, who grew up in London, for example, going to an Orthodox all Ashkenazi school where I was one of maybe three brown people, um, now learning this term made me feel seen because I was always referred to as Sephardi. I'm like, but that means Spanish. What do you mean Sephardi? I'm not Spanish. And right, you know, right. Um, so it's it for me. It's it, and for a lot of Mizrahim, it's it's uh, a great way for us to identify identify the difference in in our experience because it was not the same as as our the, our Ashkenazi counterparts. You know. So yeah. That's a wonderful overview. I think that's really important as well. And just so that in case there is anyone who's tuning in who, who wants to understand where the term Ashkenazi comes from, because that's a more, uh, it's another term that might be more, people are more familiar with. It's the Jews in Spain, like my family, that uh, during the Inquisition left and went uh, up north as opposed to down south to Africa and went through Germany and, and eventually settled in Poland and then Holocaust. Right. If I'm not yeah, mistaken, yeah. it actually translates to German, right? Ashkenazi I believe so. Germans. Yeah. Um, yeah. Then they spread out through Poland and everywhere. So, so. it's a pretty incredible history that our, our people have. And I, I, one thing that I, as much as I love understanding the distinction between our, between our diaspora um, uh, experiences is that no matter, at the end of the day, we all came from the same place. We all came from the same region, the same land. And I think it's pretty incredible that we have the same customs, even though they may be in different accents with different melodies when we're, you know, singing our brachas, we're still all lighting menorahs. And that to me is just magical that after 2000 years, right. we're able to do these things that, that no matter where we are, what our differences, we're one people at the end of the day. There, there <laughs> is one difference. Yes, go ahead. <laughs> Your haraset is better. My what? Your haraset at Pesach. It's the uh, the Whoa. mortar, supposedly. You put dates and spices, and it's it's a far superior dish than to the one that the Ashkenazi do, which is a little bit apple-y and gray. <laughs> I mean, it's not as great. <laughs> well, funny story. Persian Jews, only Persian Jews have a specific custom. It's very interesting because Iranian Jews, though we're Mizrahim, our experience in diaspora is very different than the, than the Arab world. But there is a specific custom with Dayenu that Iranian Jews do, which is when they when we sing Dayenu, we whip each other with uh, spring onions. Oh my gosh! I love that. Pain. 
people go start taking their belts. <laughs> like people start whipping each other. I like run, I run and I, but yeah, it's this only Iranians, uh, only Iranian Jews do that, so. And is that seen in any other Persian uh, traditions, the, these whipping of green onions? No, because it's it correlates with, I guess, slavery and one of the brachas. I'm not very religious, uh, so I don't know, but like it correlates with like whipping slaves basically. That's incredible. I, I'm familiar with one um, uh, Persian holiday, and I think it's the new year uh, where you set money on the table and different little um, symbolic foods and, and whatnot. And all that was going through my head is like, this is Shavuot. Uh, very, very similar and must be, you know, remnants of the Silk Road and the, the, the passing of traditions. It's amazing how closely related everyone truly is at the end of the day there are even words that i had no idea like somebody the word i guess for hell in hebrew do you know what it is Gehenom. Gehenom. in persian the word for hell is uh jahannam and oh I'm my like, gosh it's the same thing that is a trip because persian is a is a indo-european language right obviously i'm sure the word jahannam comes from the arab the arab conquest and because a lot of arabic like sort of uh, there's a lot of there's a few Arabic words in there as well, so maybe that's where it comes from. But it just tripped me out. I was like, wow, those countries are all so close to 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 okay. each other. So it's really, I guess, not that surprising. But yeah, there's a lot of similarities there. Well, the shorashim, the root of the Indian. words, yeah, what's that? Completely. I was just saying that the shorashim, the root of the words, are identical. So. Yeah. Also, this is a total side conversation um, about Ganom in general as being a kind of an added uh, addition to the, the Jewish uh, tradition um, mm -hmm. with the onset of Christianity, which was also uh, talking about hell and whatnot. So I don't know if this is correct. Take it all with a grain of salt. But it was a fascinating conversation because I don't practice uh, Judaism religiously. I'm a secular cultural Jew. And so I was really fascinated to find out one year, uh, not too long ago, that there technically is a hell yeah. in Judaism. And we're like, what? What? It was in Slen. And then, yeah. It was considered like the area right outside of the, like an area outside of the city walls in Jerusalem, I believe, that they refer mm. to it. Gun, um, um, I, I don't remember the specifics. Yeah. Well, um, during the uh, the uprising last May, uh, it was a really difficult time for a lot of people, and um, especially among friends, not necessarily Jewish. And um, one of the things that we had in common with the emo Jews group, and which is why we all came together, is a bunch of us lost friendships um, over what was going on and not really being able to talk to people, not just from the Jewish community, but also non-Jewish community. I was just wondering if, this also happened to you. Yeah, um, I got in a lot of unfollows. I didn't lose personal friends, but I, I, in my mind, have a very, I'm very aware of the friends that I have that are just steering clear of this, specifically friends who are very like um, into social justice movements who just do not want to discuss this. Um, so that's in my mind, that's, and, and it's sad because it kind of makes me feel like, okay, you don't, at least ask me about it. But just last week, um, somebody, he's a friend of a friend that I've known for many years who, when, when the young man who was killed by the terrorist in Jerusalem, I posted about it. And um, he, he wrote in the comments um, and vice versa. I basically posted like murdering Jews is not, is not uh, uh, gonna free Palestine in so many words, like that's that's not activism, that's just murder. And he posted, he wrote, um, and vice versa. And I was like, nah, bro, that's not the time. And he, and he went off on a tangent. And I was like, you know, why am I fighting with you? Why are you choosing this post to bring this up with? And I mean, long the long and short of it is, yes, I've, I've you know, had to let some people go and let people have let go of me and that's fine, it, it's, it, it sucks, but at the end of the day, 
in terms of followers, the followers that are meant to be your followers and that are loyal and true and believe in what you're saying and connect with what you're saying are gonna stick around. And the same goes for your friends in your real life. Like the ones who are your real friends at the very least will want to hear you out. And it's like, you're my friend, you know me, you know my values, you know my ethics. Like you're just gonna stop talking to me because I'm a Zionist. Like talk to me, you know, and a real friend would. You can disagree, you don't have to agree with everything, but I think that if people actually gave each other a chance and spoke about it, we would all find yeah. that we have a lot more in common than we don't. Um, I will say that to I, talk I, and listen. I think that's that? part of the problem is we're so ingrained in having to pick a side because that's how the issues are being presented yes. to us, um, that you have to pick one over the other and why can't you pick both? It's not a zero sum game. Yeah. It's not a zero sum game. And and anybody who tells you, and I've posted about this too, like if anybody tells you it's one side or the other, that's not you're 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 that's called extremism, right? That's extremism. It's only us or it's only them or whatever. That is extremism. So all of these people that are reposting all this stuff that is part of this PR campaign that has been going on since the 60s. Okay, don't get me started. I'm gonna go nuts. But like, it's been going on since the 60s and unfortunately it's working. And the newest thing now is like, we will not speak to, to, to Israelis. We will not have a conversation. We will not discuss it. There's nothing to discuss. Okay, so what, like then what? We're just gonna stay in a perpetual state of war? Like? No, we're all gonna become followers of your page and have the conversation there if the spaces are not provided to us safely in order to have these conversations. Yeah, join my page. I will say though, yeah. I, I did, the, this has been a lifesaver for me and all of you with Instagram. I, restricting accounts and restricting my comment section has been a godsend because I, I really genuinely want people to be able to have conversations and I would love for my page to be a conduit for that where people can feel free enough to discuss things and talk about things. But at the end of the day, I need to set boundaries for myself because my mental health comes first and be constantly called a colonizer and a settler and a, uh, all of these things, it's not healthy for me. And plus, I have a life. I can't sit on my phone on Instagram all day replying to everybody. So some people say that now you've made it an echo chamber. Well, fine. It is what it is. I, I don't, you know, of course I'm happy to change minds, but my page isn't there. People that are coming on and leaving nasty comments don't want to change their minds. And that's not why they're leaving comments. So it is what it is. Well, speaking of a life, you're all dolled up. I hear you have a party to go to. Tell yeah. us about it. Uh, JQ International does their biggest event every year is their uh, Guilty Pleasures Hanukkah party. It's a queer Hanukkah party in West Hollywood. And tonight is the first time they're doing it in person since 2019 because of COVID. So um, of course I have to show up and show out, honey. Can I show you the ball? Book? And I, I decided I'm going for brown. I usually do blonde, but I'm serving like Sophia Loren, Gina Lola Brigida, like ah, ah, ah. 1950s Italian movie starlet. I just showed up in Hollywood and I'm here for my close up. You look absolutely fabulous and you're going to have a wonderful time. I wish I was there. I wish I could fly on, on a plane and meet you. I wish you could too. Yeah. Next year in Los Angeles. <laughs> Nobody well, does fun else... like LA. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, I'm usually in California pretty often. So I mean, there's pretty good chances. Oh, you got to be next time. Make sure you coordinate it with JQ International. And you gotta of come course, that has to happen. Now, before we conclude, is there anything that you would like to say and share? Something that might have popped mm -hmm. up? Just go with love and listen to people. And one thing that's really been on my mind being in the realm of social media is this, this I know we all have this urge to kind of like attack and put everybody on blast for being anti-Semitic. Um, so I guess what I want to say is, and it's something that I'm working on constantly for myself as well, is 
it does you it doesn't help anything so let's try and focus on the positive and people are more likely to listen to you and what you have to say if you're not um you know throwing the term anti-semitic around and pointing fingers and let's focus on jewish joy um and um I'm not saying don't call people out but do it sort of i don't know do it good. <laughs> <laughs> Do it good. I love that. Well, many thanks to the Empress Mizrahi for joining JQD today as our fifth Hanukkah Hadi. Be sure to follow their work on all the socials. And thank you to our sponsor organization, Creating Accessible Neighborhoods. You can also follow JQD on social media. The links are in the chat. Thank you for tuning in. Let's keep building this community, showing up authentically, celebrating our true selves and being proud of our Jewish queer and then some identities. Happy Hanukkah, Chag Hanukkah Sameach, bye. Yeah, thank you so much for having me, it was such an honor.